and welcome back into another edition of the Commitment Issues Podcast. I'm Rob Cassidy, joined this week by only Nick Kruger, Woody Womack on injured reserve with some sort of undisclosed sickness uh, that he claims to have, and he's bedridden. Uh, before we jump in, you can always follow us on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Cassidy underscore Rob, and Nick is at Rivals Krug City, correct? That's right. Two O's. Against <laughs> Kirk City with two O's. Uh, anyway, loaded show this week. We'll be joined by uh, Missouri head coach Barry Odom uh, in a conversation I had with him a little bit later. But we will jump right in here to uh, this week's top five. Uh, number one, I guess you have to lead with Big 12 expansion or non expansion, right, Nick? I mean, it was uh, much ado about nothing uh, at the Big 12 meetings. Uh, they met. Everybody expected them to possibly announce some expansion targets. Uh, they, in true Big 12 fashion, head faked everybody, said we will not expand. Uh, and that should be that for now, I think. What do you think this means to kind of the overall state of college football? And, and you know, what effect could this have going forward on the Big 12? Well, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to approach this from a purely fanatical standpoint as a, as a football viewer who now lives in Big 12 country, watches my share of Big 12 football. I was really pulling for expansion just because I wanted more teams in the mix. I wanted a little bit more variety. I wanted, you know, I wanted the true uh, championship format with a couple of divisions to mix it up a little bit. You know, I really feel like that adds a little something to the experience, you know, when you're talking about, you know, just the flow of the season. I know there's far reaching consequences, you know, financial and television and otherwise that, you know, maybe contributed to, you know, the the final decision here. But but I don't really care about all that. Like, <laughs> I really wanted to see some other teams get in there and, you know, just add a few more colors to the crayon box, you know, and, and I was a little disappointed that we didn't get that, especially after all the the posturing and the discussion and the speculation. It really built the hype. And uh, yeah, and it's just like you said, in typical conference fashion, we're left here with a with an empty basket and, you know, and in the same boat that we were always in. And it really just seems... I mean, it's, 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 it's really just a funny, you know, charade to put us all through with, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, with all the teams they were considering, too. I mean, there were like 12 teams that they were on the list as possibilities. And really just adding Houston to the mix really could have, um, you know, could have done some things. It could have stabilized some things. It could have made things more volatile. It really would have, you know, created a, an, ed- an added element of drama, which is great for you and me and, you know, podcast fodder and, and written fodder. And, and we just, you know, now we're left without all of that. Yeah, and you mentioned Houston, and I think we probably need to touch on this and what it means for everybody's favorite head coaching candidate, uh, major head coaching candidate, Tom Herman. Um, You know, I think the Big 12 is dead eventually once this Bill of Rights runs out, but that's, you know, 2025 where you and I may be dead as well. Uh, So really, who knows on that? But, you know, it stays intact for a while. Houston does not enter the mix, uh, which leaves them still, you know, searching for a major conference to possibly join or possibly not join. Do you think this affects Tom Herman in the way that if they would have gotten into the Big 12, which I don't think any Texas school really wanted them, uh, maybe he sticks around at Houston because he's suddenly in a major conference. The fact that this doesn't work, do you think that that plays to the advantage of uh, you know, whoever may be in the market to hire him? I don't want to speculate on who may have a coaching opening, uh, but do you think that this kind of plays Tom Herman out of Houston's hands? Well, you know, I've heard I've heard a few you know t- talking to high school coaches i've heard a few uh you know a few rumors about possible music chairs uh musical chairs scenario that involve uh tom herman and and what the cause and effect might be should he leave houston and you know i think i I mean, I would think from an outsider's perspective, Houston joining the Big 12 would have been a great way to secure Herman's spot as that head coach, regardless of you know what, what takes place at other schools that he's been linked to as far as the coaching search goes. I think now with them left out of the mix, and especially if they don't make the... They, they could be the most convincing one-loss team in college football this year uh, in, terms of, in terms of their results and how they play and be left out of the playoff by virtue of the fact that they're just in a group of five conference and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know Tom Herman personally, if his, you know, if his main objective is to win championships because the money's always going to be there for him, uh, you know, then I would think that he'd be more prone to take a, you know, an opportunity at a, at a program that gives him that, that chance year in and year out, because otherwise, you know, regardless of all the things that are going on, all the great things that are going on in Houston, the new stadium, the new facilities, all the money that they're putting into that athletics program, you know, if, if you, it, all of that means nothing if you're not in a situation to take advantage of it from a program perspective in the ultimate goal of winning championships, right? No, I completely agree. I think, you know, Texas is always going to be, no matter if they would have gotten into the Big 12 or even gotten into the SEC, I think Texas, if that job opens, you know, they've got more money than everyone. 
Uh, they've got the tradition. They've got the facilities. It, it's really hard to say no to them, no matter who you are, as long as you're not Nick Saban or somebody in Alabama. Um, but, you know, I think this might help even open, let's say that Charlie Strong does stick around at Texas and another job opens. You know, I think this opens Herman's eyes up to maybe getting out of there a little bit more than before. I don't think that anybody thought that he was going to uh, stay there no matter what. But I think, maybe, this, well, this maybe here, not, maybe, not, the, you know, maybe this, maybe this is the better question. Let's say, let's say, Let's say Texas turns, the, hypothetically speaking, let's say Texas turns things around, runs the table. Let's say the same thing happens at LSU and Ed Orgeron sticks around. Where's the next logical place for Herman to go if not staying at Houston, would you say? Ooh, you know, that's a good one. If those two keep their coaches, um, then, you know, things get interesting. I mean, you never know what's going to happen with some of these other schools. It doesn't appear that Auburn is going to open. It does not appear that Tennessee is going to open. Um, I don't know. You know, you'd have to have a re- you know, Maybe that buys him another year. It doesn't appear that USC is going to open anymore, even though people some USC, insane USC fans think it should. Um, then maybe you have a situation where he bides his time and waits another year uh, for something to happen. I do not think Texas is going to run the table. <laughs> I have not believed in them since week one. Uh, they're a fine football team, but they're they're not back by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we should probably well, listen, I, I, I long thought, just, just to put a cap on it, I, really, I, I long thought that Iowa State was the best one-win team uh, in college football <laughs> that I had watched all season. I thought they were going to do... Give Texas a little bit more of a run for their money. So their defense, hey, say what you want to. Since making the change, they're chipping away. They're getting just a little bit better every week defensively. So maybe, you know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, and it's not like they're playing a juggernaut this weekend in my alma mater. They're playing Kansas State this weekend, who has not looked very good offensively. So, you know, there's a chance. they. I mean, they, I, I think they should definitely be favored to win this game this weekend. But running the table, who knows, man. They still have to play. I have not. Have they played West Virginia yet? They no, I'd have to look. Uh, West no, Virginia's yeah. going to smoke them. <laughs> that's a thing that's going to happen. Speaking of getting smoked, though, uh, Georgia has been very good at that this year. Maybe not getting smoked, but getting beaten. Uh, they lost to Vanderbilt, which bruised the ego this weekend. Uh, you know, you add that in with the last second losses to Tennessee and just how really rocky the Kirby Smart era has been. I'm wondering, Nick, and I'll throw this to you first. Do you think that this has impacted the way that recruits are going to look at Georgia? Maybe not even in this cycle, but at the next cycle, just kind of the way they've kind of limped out of the gate in the smart era. No, I don't think so. I mean, I I, I think anybody, uh, I, I think the things that Georgia has going for it right now is is regardless of how Kirby Smart does this year, he is going to get the first year pass based on the fact that he was the top assistant in the country coming away from Alabama, getting that head coaching job, coming in, playing a, a true freshman starting quarterback in Jacob Eason. Uh, there was always going to, I think anybody with, with a little bit of common sense would have assumed that there's going to be some growing pains associated with that. I don't, I don't know. I've heard nobody suggest that Georgia's defense is, uh, elite uh, one way or the other. Um, you know, there's, there's been glaring deficiencies there. I think uh, most notably in the secondary, uh, the, the people have been quick to point out. So, you know, you have to give, you know, you, you have to give somebody with that sort of pedigree coming into a, a new coaching job. Uh, a, a little bit of a grace period there. And, you know, r- regardless of what happens, I think his message has resonated well with recruits. I know just just looking back, uh, you know, to my soiree down to down to Houston when I talked to uh, uh, Walker Little most recently, five star offensive tackle, you know, that his his relationship with Georgia kind of came out of nowhere. And he seemed uh, legitimately interested in, in going going on that visit and checking out and seeing what what it is that they're doing down there. I think there's still a buzz about that program, regardless of how they do this season, uh, just based on the fact that they have uh, key players, uh, y- young talent at key positions, I should say, uh, you know, plus the new coach, that, that that's enough for them to, to get the benefit of the doubt this season. Yeah, I agree. I don't think anybody logical. You know, I'm not suggesting that he would be on the hot seat or anything like that. But you know how fickle recruits can be at times. And, you know, I don't think it's going to – derail them completely recruiting no matter how the season plays out i kind of with you there i think the only thing that could get to them and like we always say on the show nothing happens in a vacuum in recruiting and everything is perception uh, the only way the perception changes i think is if they have a bad season and then some of these higher profile guys don't sign there that are already committed because they have a pretty nice class in place as things stand now uh let's say that some of these guys get spooked then you know an outsider looking in sees oh here's a bad season and you know some other guys are already spooked and then maybe that compounds for the 2018 class uh that's the one worry that i'd have with with georgia right now and like i said it's not the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination it's a first year for a first-time head coach who you know by all uh accounts you know has the pedigree to, to do this job and do it well uh and you know like you said he has really resonated with recruits you talk to guys even in florida that really enjoy and in alabama that really enjoy kirby smart you know they're really Involved with KJ Britt, uh, you know, a rivals 100 linebacker out of Alabama, and, and you know some other really good players in the region too. So, like we, like I said, you know, you and I agree here. I don't think that it's a 
ton of time to panic for Georgia right now, but you know, things could obviously be going better. Uh, moving on to somebody that hasn't scored many points with many people is DJ Matthews, the rivals 100 wide receiver committed to Florida state from Florida. <laughs> it's such a weird thing with him. You know, he's one of these guys that's kind of from the Tate Martell mold of really, really, really likes kind of to drink in the Twitter attention. Mm-hmm. So he goes on a visit to Tennessee this weekend <laughs> And then he pulls this thing where he tweets, I'm SEC bound, and tweets a whole bunch of pictures, takes Florida State commit out of his bio, has the world thinking he flipped the Tennessee. He did not flip the Tennessee, uh, but he never confirms that, you know? So people are like asking him, and he's not answering, and then he tweets out, why do I got to say it? Isn't it clear? So then you reach out to sources on the Tennessee end of things, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, hey, he didn't commit to Tennessee. So, you know, he's just playing the Twitter game. Did he have a good time at Tennessee? Sure. Is Tennessee a possibility for him? Sure. This is not the first time he's done something like this, though. It's maybe the maybe we can talk about the larger thing and not just DJ. These kids that, that seem to drink in the attention, it you know, it's a headache. It's not, you know, I'm not going to fault them for it. I would do the same thing if I was if I was that age. Uh, but you know, have you seen things like this in Texas, or is this like an East Coast thing? Because you know, we've got another one with Alex Leatherwood is now announced. He is committed to Alabama. He has announced his intention to announce his final announcement in December, which is a move out of the Sam Bruce book, who was committed to Miami and made a big to-do of announcing he was still committed to Miami last year. Uh, I feel like this is maybe a Southeast thing. This doesn't seem to happen as much in other areas of the country. No, I, in, in fact, I would, I would argue that I kind of have sort of the opposite issue here in Texas as far as some of the, some of the high-level recruits really don't use Twitter all that much. I mean, it's, it's, that, that, <laughs> that's perplexing, man. I mean, that's, that's really a case of having too much time on your hands, literally too much time on your hands with that cell phone in hand, putting all those messages out there. That's, that's really a strange, I don't, I don't understand what the net gain is there uh, for him to be putting all that stuff out there like that. If, um, you know, because it certainly isn't going to do you any favors with the school that you're committed to. If you're not committing to a different school, that kind of makes them frustrated, wouldn't it? I mean, I like who, who does that actually benefit by you doing that? Nothing. It's just a bored high school kid that, you know, like, like I said, I can, if I squint, I can see the appeal. Like, you know, there are all these strangers that are treating you like a superstar on the internet. And if I say, Hey, I'm really looking, I'm really looking at Tennessee. Then I get 30 strangers interacting with me and begging me and telling me how great I am to to stay home. Yeah. yeah, We won't talk about what kind of losers those are, but I mean, that's why he does it. Right. Right. But then you end up, then you end up as the tweet of the week on this podcast, the very next week with your mom saying, why are these guys so mean to my commit? (laughs) You know, (laughs) My son, yeah. man. you and I are one hundred percent in agreement there, man. I mean, it's 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 perplexing for sure. And uh, but you know, news being news, that is not news. Uh, DJ Matthews did not flip to Tennessee, although he never said he didn't. He just like let the internet think he did. It was a very very strange thing. I don't think he's going anywhere. To be honest, I think that he's playing this game. He's been committed to Florida State for so long. Maybe he's bored with it. Uh, I think he lands at Florida State. Uh, so we don't need to spend more time. On that topic, we can move over to more Big 12 talk, though. This is a Big 12 uh, heavy episode of this podcast, and we can touch on West Virginia here, who is undefeated, landed another four-star in-state commit this week, and man, they are looking good. Uh, You know, it took them a while to kind of get some solid footing in the Big 12, but it looks like they've done it in their new home, and now, you know, what can they do? What's the ceiling for West Virginia recruiting? Uh, If they're going to be this kind of team going forward and be a competitive team in the Big 12, where do you think they need to live as far as recruiting goes, and do you think they can recruit nationally? Well, I mean, it's, at some point they've got it. I would think that they're going to try and and pivot there uh, towards towards being a little bit more uh, substantial recruiter uh, in terms in terms of the type of talent that they go for. Because you know, right now, I, I mean, my 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 perception of uh, West Virginia as a program in regards to recruiting is a team that's kind of in a remote location that is between some areas it doesn't have it doesn't have a lot of homegrown talent available in most cases or at least a large amount of it so you kind of have to be creative with the way that you recruit obviously they're a, a really snappy offense by reputation and they do a good job of finding guys that uh, fit in well with that offense but now i think you know if, if there's an opportunity here for them in the big 12 especially this season uh you know to to be the team coming out of this conference and and they're doing it convincingly on both sides of the ball both offensively and defensively and that's an opportunity for them you know to really take that next step and say uh you know to recruits that they might not have otherwise reached for listen you know this is this is the moment here we have an opportunity in this conference not just this year but beyond you know to to rise up and be the, and to be the team the power team in this conference is a is a complete unit because as as we know in the Big 12 uh, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of good offenses. The defense 
is sort of spotty <laughs> with, with from team to team. So for so for them to come out and say, hey, listen, we're the new because I think that's really sort of the the lane that Oklahoma has stayed in, right? They've been the most complete team top to bottom over the course of a long period of time where they've been really stout defensively, really good offensively, and everybody else has sort of been really good at one particular thing but not that complete unit on both sides of the ball. So if, if West Virginia can start playing that card where they can say, hey, listen, we're that team now in this conference, um, you know, and milk that, they, I, think they're, I think they're due for a run. Uh, you know, of getting of getting a few more higher profile kids out there than they otherwise would have. I mean, it's 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 certainly going to be incremental, but relative to what their own expectations probably were coming into the season, as far as looking at their recruiting board, I think they can afford to to go out there and try and uh, take some gambles on some kids that they might not otherwise have thought that they had a chance with. See, I think that this thing is coming to a head rather soon. I think that this is going to be the product of a lot of work West Virginia has done. Um, I think 2018 might be a big recruiting year for West Virginia. Hear me out here, and this is why. They, you know, they've always kind of had ties to that Pittsburgh area. They're not very far away from there, and there's some talent there. But what they're doing now is they're, they, they've already built these inroads in Florida, and you see them. They've got Mike Harley, who I think the world of, who really fits that offense uh, to commit there this year. They recruit relatively well in Florida already, and when the guys that they don't get seem to consider them. So they've planted all these seeds in Florida. Uh, they're not an unknown down here by any stretch of the imagination. They offer the kids they should offer. They are in play for a lot of top kids already. Maybe they don't land them. So they're on kids' minds here. They run off a season like this. Let's say they win the Big 12. Let's say they somehow make the playoff. Then all of a sudden, oh, I've always kind of wondered about that school. Okay, now I'm definitely going to visit. Uh, and then you take that's how you st- take the step forward is you build those inroads when maybe you're an up-and-coming team, which they've done a very, very good job of already to this point. Uh, and then you wait for it to pay off when you have a season like this. Uh, so should they continue this? Uh, they've already got the attention of, I think, a lot of top players in the 2018 class of this state in Florida, which is where you want to live <laughs> if you're trying to recruit anywhere in this this area of the country. Uh, and then, you know, it can really, really pay off in 2018. And as long as they don't falter, I think you're going to see a nice little recruiting bump. And if they got to get aggressive with it, though, they can't be afraid to swing and miss. Uh, I think they get aggressive in Florida. They can really, really, really do some damage in, in the near future. I don't think that this is a far off. Uh, I think it has been a gradual thing, but I think it's getting ready to, to pay dividends. Well, no, I and I totally see that side of the coin too. And I've always thought that West Virginia compares similarly to uh, Louisville in terms of the way that the sort of the areas that they recruit in, especially when you're talking about Florida, kind of the way that they uh, are kind of hitting their stride in the in the ways that they that they are. So I think so. I think I, I mean in in Louisville, um, maybe didn't come out of nowhere, but uh, but cert- but certainly very successful this year on a on a very convincing level. Um, you know, I, I could totally see West Virginia being sort of like uh, the new Louisville. I mean, if they if they're a player like Lamar Jackson away from from really being like that, uh, you know, a a, a, nas- a a major national power, I guess we'll 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 call them in in these circumstances. I mean, they're what are they? They're top fifteen team right now, or top? Yeah, I mean, they 12? look really good. And you, you know, it could be. In, there are some parallels there. There are other parallels there too. West Virginia, maybe not to the extent that Louisville does it, had always taken the approach that I kind of took at the bars in college where it's like, you know, you offer everybody and anybody with a pulse really. And then you really have not anybody with a pulse, anybody that has some upside, uh, you offer them and then you hope, you know, for the best. It's the shotgun approach. It's, you know, whoever bites. And then when you do start getting good, you hope that really pays off. And I think that's happened for Louisville now. Uh, they offer more players than anybody in the country. I, I swear, everybody in the world has a Louisville offer. You have one. I have one. Right. Uh, <laughs> everybody's pets has one. You know, your wife probably has one. It's, but you know, it's worked out for them somehow. And then you know, they're they're kind of notorious for for pulling offers as well. But you know, both sides of the coin, it seems to work for them. Now, to a team that doesn't offer as many people, and you know, I'm going to be real honest here. I'm working off of Woody's notes before he fell sick with the plague. Uh, this. <laughs> This uh, this number five topic just says Texas loses a commit. Does it even matter? Uh, I missed this. Obviously, I do not work <laughs> in Texas as you do. I do not know who they lost, so I'll let you take it from here. Well, that's that's a reference to uh, offensive lineman Xavier Newman, uh, who decommitted from Texas after a recent visit to Colorado, and then just last night uh, made that commitment to Colorado. Um, and he's not a guy that I've talked to a ton because of the timeline of me taking over as Texas analyst. I talked to him once in the spring, did an interview with him. I can tell you, uh, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know how much I'm trying to put myself over here. It doesn't really make a difference anyway. But I could tell when I had talked to him in the spring that he was really high on Colorado. I think, I, I think a lot of recruits really liked. 
Colorado and continue to like Colorado, but as far as like a preseason commitment was concerned, weren't convinced that they should commit there. But now with the season that they're having and obviously showing that they're a legitimate team here on a national uh, level, you know, now, now that confidence is in, is instilled with that. I guess, you know, I, boy, what, what a conversation to have on the heels of our, of our discussion about West Virginia here, because, you know, Colorado might be in line for a similar sort of, uh, you know, boon as far as commitments go. And it, and it does matter uh, to Texas in the sense that they just don't have very m- many commitments right now across the board. And, you know, we've talked, we've talked over and over again with Texas's recruiting strategy. They don't, you know, they, 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 they don't look to get all those commitments up front and and that really and Charlie Strong's confidence level in himself heading into the season you know led him to not you know twist twist those arms so to speak and now he's left with just like uh you know I'm not looking at the the screen right now five five or six commitments in this class and uh as long as the questions persist about his future with Texas that puts him in a bad spot coming down you know coming down the line here on the home stretch for Texas I mean there's certainly there's certainly a lot of people watching out for guys like Marvin Wilson, who you know they everybody everybody's thinking that if if Texas can right the ship, if they can win out like we talked about before, if if confidence is reinstilled in Charlie Strong and his staff, you know then then they will get those late commitments. But in the meantime, for a guy like Xavier Newman, who committed to, who committed to Texas because it was it, it was if if you're if you're fifty fifty between. An unsure, an unsure commodity like Colorado and a proven brand like Texas, you're going to go with Texas, right? And then when Colorado comes up, they go on a visit. He sees how well they're doing. His other teammates are, are you know, LaVisca Chenault is a four-star receiver committed to Colorado, also goes to DeSoto with him. Katie Nixon is a guy that we all expect to commit to Colorado here relatively soon. Um, you know, so there's, there's a whole new level of familiarity out there. There's other kids, like I mentioned, from Texas that are considering going to Colorado here in the near future that we think uh, may, may commit here shortly. So, you know, you know, all these kids know each other. They all they're all more or less coming from that Dallas area. Um, you know, it made it a real easy decision for him uh, to, to make that flip. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it's in some ways, in some ways, it matters more for Colorado that they're that they're back on the map in such a convincing fashion. You know, with Texas, it's it's not a, a big surprise. You know, if they're, they're still in great position with a lot of guys if, you know, if they put together a really nice uh, run down the, down the rest of the season here. So, uh, in Xavier Newman's case, I wouldn't think it's such a big deal uh, spe- specifically as far as Texas goes. Um, but you know, because there'll be other players available uh, for them, you know, should should things uh, right themselves. Yeah, it's a bigger issue, I think, in the big picture of not hey, you know, this guy's really going to make or break Charlie Strong's career or make or break Texas, and it, it, that's not it. I think it's we're if I'm a Texas fan, I'm thinking we're struggling again. Charlie Strong's already there's buzz around him, and holy crap, we just lost the commitment to Colorado, uh, upstart Colorado. Uh, none of those things compounded play very well for the perception of the program or the perception of Charlie Strong, who people have long since kind of been wondering about if he's the right guy for that job. And now, you know, it's one thing after another, a small class, if they don't win out, if they do get smacked around by West Virginia, which I expect they do. Although for some reason, I thought they already played. Uh, if they let's say they lose to Kansas State this weekend, it, you know, it's just a lot of, of <laughs> bad negative factors uh, working against Strong and Texas. Uh, but, you know, call it good for Colorado, though, as Mike McIntyre, the head coach over there, is a friend of the podcast. He has been on here before. If they if they if they win against ba- they get Baylor at home, you know, so if they if they manage to win that game, that that listen, before we're talking about West Virginia, they got to make it past Baylor. Right. So oh, that's true. They lose that one, too. And then, uh, and then TCU to close out the season. I mean, those, you know, and in between you have Texas Tech, which suddenly seems like a, a winnable game, uh, given their sort of inconsistencies. I think in Kansas is nobody's <laughs> expecting them to beat anybody until they do. So, uh, you know, so I mean, listen, ba- Baylor, West Virginia, and TCU to close out the season. And TCU is a home game that could end up being a big vi- visit weekend for them. <laughs> you know, uh, if they if they get things going in their direction, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to give Texas the benefit of the doubt here. Uh, you know, just, just for the sake of <laughs> this conversation, you know, uh, <laughs> for the sake of your, for the sake of your Twitter have... mentions and email follow up <laughs> emails as well. All right. From, uh, from the big 12 to a former big 12 member, I sat down with Missouri head coach Barry Odom, uh, earlier this week, you know, we talked about a lot of things, including if they'll ever play Kansas again, including his thoughts on an early signing period. And, you know, we'll flip over to that conversation now. So I guess Rob kicking it to past Rob. Joined now by Missouri head coach Barry Odom. Thanks a lot for coming on. I appreciate having you and, and all that. How are things in Columbia? You bet, man. Thanks, thanks for uh, having the opportunity to be with you uh, this afternoon. And 
looking forward to a, to a home game this weekend, and and uh, it's homecoming for us. We we'll, should be a great crowd, and and uh, our guys are anxious to uh, get back in the in the competitive arena. I'm just interested in your background at Missouri. I mean, obviously you're pretty much born and bred there besides, you know, obviously being born in Oklahoma, but you've been around Missouri athletics for a long, long, long time when you consider both stints and everything like that. The way that you got the head coaching job was a little bit unique though. When, when Gary stepped away and stepped down, did you kind of know you were going to be a candidate or did it all kind of take you off guard a little bit as quickly as it all happened? No, well, really it was, uh, you know, when, when we found out coach was, was retiring, uh, you know, didn't, we, we still had games left in the season, still had three games left. And, uh, you know, my focus at, at that point was to try to do everything I could, uh, to, uh, continue to get our defense to play well and then wanted to do everything we could to try to get those seniors to a bowl game last year. And we came up short in that. And then, uh, the, the Friday before, uh, or the day before our last, game our last uh you know we played arkansas uh, game 12 last year and the day before that game our, our director of athletics uh called and said hey i want you to uh to interview for for the for the job uh and i want you to interview on sunday and uh so um you know i didn't have really i, I i've been ready for the last couple of years because I knew I was getting close to have an opportunity to interview for a head coaching job. So I knew program wise what, what a plan would be. Uh the the easy part of uh or maybe even the most difficult part of interviewing for this job was I knew when I walked into the interview room that I was going to know more about this place uh than than anybody they could bring in there. And uh so, you know, we um I didn't I didn't think another thing about it until uh, the game was was over. Um, I think we played Arkansas on a Friday night or Friday afternoon, so the game was over there. And then uh, spent spent time Saturday getting ready for to visit with those guys on Sunday. So, uh, and then it happened pretty quickly from there. I had a couple of different interviews at, at different uh, institutions during that time as well. You never know how the timing's going to work out. Um, and then they had a second round of interviews and went through those and and then found out you know a couple of days later. Obviously, Mizzou is a special place to you with as long as you've been there. We've all seen the the video that kind of went viral of them telling the players that you got the job and them being so excited for you. What was your reaction when they called you and told you you got the job? Well, it's a, it's a, you know, there's a lot of people that were here uh, before me that uh, has has turned Mizzou into what it is today. Uh, the opportunity to, to take over for the winningest coach in program history, um, you know, means a lot to me to try to continue to do the things that he did, that Coach Pinkle did uh, for 15 years, and then take it to another level at some point. And uh, there's a lot of really good people around here. We've got great support administratively. Uh, we've got a tremendous group of coaches this season. You know, at, at the halfway point, we're not where we want to be. Uh, we understand that, uh, you know, the, the process that uh, we want to uh, have a chance to, to win a championship uh, we're going to get there. That's going to happen. It's it's going to take uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of support, and uh, a lot of grit and determination to to go get that done. You mentioned you interviewed for some other jobs while you were interviewing for Missouri. I know that Memphis was one of those places that you coached at prior that you were kind of tied to. Did you interview there, and how kind of far along did you guys get in that process before you ended up taking the head job at Mizzou? Uh, there, there, um, you know, got in discussions just from the the. Uh, director of athletics there, Tom Bowen, I know very well and, and have tremendous respect for him. And, and that entire uh, community was so great to me. Um, you know, a guy named Brad Martin was was the president when I was there, and, and um, you know, has been very active on getting Memphis back to to where it is today. And then obviously got respect for Justin Puente for the job that he did there, and you know, feel uh, fortunate that I was a small part of of that turnaround. And uh, so it was a you know that that place uh, will forever. It made me a better person, made me a better coach, and uh, you know they've 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 made a great hire in uh who they ended up hiring and and uh he's you know will will continue to lead them and but that you know that was uh you know some discussions were were had and uh you know this with the timing of everything and multiple job openings um and and where you know it always you you can't ever plan on when and how it's going to work out uh you just got to if you have an opportunity um to look at a job, you've got to find out what is the best fit 
uh, not you know take the emotional side out of it. So I tried to do that with with Missouri and Memphis. Uh, take that aside from it and see what was the best fit uh, at that current time. Obviously, you know, living in now with you being at Missouri. You guys are a little bit different than some of these other SEC programs where they're all located kind of by the talent base in the southeast. You know, you've got Florida and Florida and some of these other schools located in Alabama and Mississippi. Obviously, there are players in Missouri and in Kansas and Oklahoma. I mean, you've got the St. Louis area. But when you guys are at your best, where does your recruiting base need to be? Are there areas that you want to try to get into? Are you guys trying to get into Florida? Or? Well, it's got to be – we've got to take care of the state of Missouri. And you look for us the next two years in St. Louis and Kansas City – uh, it'll be two of the best years that, that those cities have ever had. And, uh, you look at some of the great players we've had in the past, uh, that are from those areas. Uh, and, and so we've got to do a tremendous job on making Mizzou, uh, the place that, that the kids in the state of Missouri want to go. And that's, that's, you know, when that becomes an option for them that they want to lead the University of Missouri to a national championship. And it's the only Division One school in the state. We've got a great support, you know, 35,000 students and a tremendous fan base. And there's, uh, you know, the experiences that, that they can come and have here are, um, you know, we, we can achieve everything that you want to achieve out of, out of being a student athlete for four or five years. They're going to vote here, maybe not vote, but at least discuss, it says on the NCAA docket, an early signing period. It's something that obviously everybody's talked about forever. It seems like everybody's kind of for it. Uh, maybe not everybody, but but most people are. Are you? Where do you kind of come down on that issue? Is that something you'd like to see? Well, I think we we need to um, number one, we need to make sure that it doesn't affect the high school uh, recruit and the high school coach uh, too adversely. I don't want it to get to a point because I was a high school coach not that long ago. Um, you want those kids to have a junior and senior year and, you know, the, the effect that recruiting, I know it's always going to be sped up. That's, that's the way it is. And we've, we've got a, a model that has worked pretty well for, for a number of years. And, uh, you know, I think there's some, some opportunities to, to maybe address that for, uh, you know, with, with an early signing period that, that adjusts it a little bit. I, I, uh, I've, I've got great faith and, and confidence that, um, that the NCAA and, and the committees that, that are looking at all factors will take that into consideration and, and do what's best for kids because that's, uh, that's what the, the number one focus that, that we need to make sure that is, uh, addressed. What's kind of, I mean, you're, if, if, and obviously you have no, you're not going, they're not going to call you up and ask you, uh, right away. But, you know, if you were design, if you were designing, uh, something like that, what's kind of the ideal situation? Well, if, we, if we're going to change, then, you know, I, I like the, I like the current model. I like what it, what it, where it's at. Uh, if, if there is some sort of change, uh, you know, there's a, there's an early signing date for the junior college signing period that, uh, that would be, makes sense to me that if you were going to change it, that you could match up a one day period there that that can happen. Uh, but again, it's, we've got a model that's worked pretty good for, for quite some time. So, uh, we'll kind of see how it plays out. Now, there are certain things, of course, I'm sure you've been asked a hundred times that I have to ask you again. Everybody wants to know when Missouri will play Kansas again. Uh, obviously, the new AD there is going to come out and said he's in favor of it. Um, is that something you think is possible to get back on the schedule? I mean, I know you don't make the final scheduling decision here, but I mean, is that something you've heard buzz of that's possible down the road? Well, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that would love to see that happen, and uh, I would be one of them. Uh, I think just being a student athlete here, uh, you know, and you talk about experiences that, that you are able to provide for your student athletes and memories for them, uh, that they are able to have, you know, either the three or four or five years here. That's one of the ones, if you go back and talk to all the guys that have graduated from Mizzou and about what their memories are, uh, from when they left the University of Missouri and there's, there's divisional championships. They talk about playing in championship games, uh, bowl games, all that, but every one of them brings up, um, playing KU and that that's uh, you know something that uh, is important to our fan base it's important to the student athletes and uh, such a historical rivalry that that goes back that uh, you know a lot of people on both sides of it um, you know have have were used to and accustomed to that that being a, a, a tremendous game and and uh, hopefully we can uh, continue to move to, to get it back have you heard anything internally about maybe moving in that direction, or is it still kind of a pipe dream? 
No, I, I, I don't. You know, the the discussions I've had on on the scheduling. You know, everybody is. You know, we've we've done a great job on trying to piece together uh, the the non conference games and who's available and and um, the the thing you do. You know, I don't I don't know the ins and outs of of how that would get get pulled off. Um, and you know, that's um, they they know administratively. Here they know that uh, I would love to play the game, and and then you know they take it from there. Obviously, that'll be a more of an athletic director decision. And speaking of athletic directors, you've been through a couple of them. I mean, the things that have been going on above your head. How much is it when a coach, when, when a change of athletic director does happen? Uh, and I don't want to use the word panic, but how much does it kind of set in where it creates a little bit of concern that the guy that hired you is gone? I mean, I've talked to other coaches that says sometimes that can concern them. Well, I didn't. I didn't get to work with uh, the guy that hired me very long. You know, I was there uh, about about eight months, and uh, then then uh, he had an opportunity, and and I uh, thought it was best that that he uh, took it. So uh, I've I've been able to develop a uh, really good relationship with uh, Jim Sturk, and uh, you know our, our vision and and uh, philosophies match up very very closely. It's been exciting for me to see and listen and learn from him in the short time he's been here. Um, I believe that without without a doubt, uh, he's going to lead Mizzou into the next number of years with with great leadership, and uh, I'm excited and, and fortunate to be a part of it. Before I get you out of here, let's, let's talk a little bit of non football stuff. When you when you're not coaching football or involved with football, and I know it takes up so much time for a head coach at an institution like Mizzou. What kind of hobbies? What do you do off the field? What's uh, what is Barry Odom into? You know what I've got? I've got three kids, um, two sons, eleven and ten, and uh, a, a daughter that's sixteen months. So, um, <laughs> so you're any, into raising any, kids. <laughs> any free time that uh, get my my sons are involved in uh, really every sport. So if I get a chance to go catch a, a fall baseball game, or uh, you know they're getting into basketball and and, and football. Uh, any of that stuff that that's usually where I'm at. I I live a really boring life. I I work. <laughs> uh, I go home and and usually go to bed and uh, get up and repeat and and trying to focus on making Mizzou better today than it was yesterday. Thursday night tonight we get away a little bit and uh, so fortunately for for me some of their games fall on that evening and uh, catch a little bit of that. So other than that, man, it's uh, that's I know that's that's. Uh, that sounds pretty bad, but that, that's where I'm at. <laughs> hey, boring is not always bad. Let's say that you've got three hour window in a day, and the only time, you, the only way you can use that three hour window is to watch a movie. What movie are you watching? Do you got a favorite one out there? Well, it's if I've got three hours, uh, in, and and there's going to be uh, a movie on, I guarantee you, within the first fifteen minutes, I'm going to be taking a nap. That's going to happen. <laughs> so. I don't, I, it's something that's uh, not not uh, not too heavy. Uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want a big heavy adrenaline rush either. Cause I'm going to relax. I'm probably going to go to sleep. They say football coaches, it does age you. And apparently it has here, man. You're that's, that's the answer I would expect from my grandfather. You know what? You know, it's crazy. <laughs> I, when I graduated Missouri, I was 23 years old and I don't feel, I don't feel any different. I feel absolutely no different at all than I did when I graduated college. So I hope that keeps, I hope that's the same. Uh, obviously I don't look like I'm 23, but, but, uh, I have no, you know, I, I still feel like uh, just walked out of college algebra. So that's, anyway, I hope that's that a, continues. That, yeah, that's an accomplishment for somebody with three kids. Anyway, <laughs> we, we appreciate, yeah, I appreciate having you though, for sure. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll do it again sometime and good luck the rest of the way. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Wow, Rob, another dandy interview. Boy, you are just really the, the, the Barbara Walters of this podcast, asking the hard-hitting questions, getting to the bottom line. Great interview there by you. But let's uh, get into something a lot of fans, as we know from, from Woody's introduction every week, I really appreciate the tweet of the week. You subtweet people all the time. You're nothing but an embarrassment. Let's get ready for this one. We have a doozy today, something that really uh, a, something that really straddles both of our neighborhoods. I'm really excited to talk about this. Last week, as soon as we posted uh, the end of our podcast, I immediately uh, get on Twitter, as I do for for our job to find a variety of different things. Lo and behold, you know my my uh, Twitter feed is a is a is a is a blaze with all sorts of uh, comments, likes, retweets uh, about about a message coming directly from uh, an assistant coach at your favorite IMG Acad- Academy to uh, presumably 2018 running back from Crosby High School, Craig Williams, here in the Houston area. 
uh, just openly recruiting them basically to come to IMG <laughs> and play football. <laughs> to which, and, and that and that in itself is not the tweet of the week. The tweet of the week comes from one of the coaches from Crosby, uh, puts our boy on blast from IMG, <clears throat> posts a screenshot of the text message to Craig, uh, you know, with with the message. I, I won't read it word for word. Basically says, here in Crosby, we family, and uh, you know, you you trying to take one of our own is you know just uh, tantamount to an act of war. And, uh, you know, and then the conversation ensued. But but it was really interesting because, uh, you know, aside from the who's right and who's wrong in this discussion, uh, you know, one of the one of the per- people that I remember seeing speak up about it was um, Grant Delpit, you know, four star, I think Rivals 100 safety that transferred out of the Houston area to didn't go to Crosby, but uh, transferred over to IMG this offseason, uh, you know, and he was like, you know, and then and then you get into the conversation of like, well, what's you know, what's wrong with, you know, trying to, because IMG is in a situation where they can recruit, there's no real consequences or repercussions to them for, for doing so, you know, and Grant Delpit speaks up and says, you know, what's wanting, what's wrong with, you know, asking to give a kid a opportunity to play national level competition, get a taste of the big time, so on and so forth. Uh, so where do you stand on, on this side of the uh, deb- debate? Before I get into it, I want to note that the the Crosby coaches using the hashtag family over Florida, which is just, I oh, may start he, using that. And he signed the bottom of the note like kids do when they announce their commitment, which I, which I thought was really great. Too. Yeah, it was a really nice touch. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with, I don't have a problem with either, either side, you know, it's IMG's uh, prerogative to try to poach kids and win football games. And it is coaches in Texas's prerogative to shame them on the internet if they, if they so choose, you know. Um, I, and you know the way he sent the text too. Like I'll read an excerpt of it. It's not like he said, "Come to IMG, your school sucks." He said, "Good luck this weekend." And if you ever want to check out IMG, uh, check out IMG. Now I don't know who this IMG video coordinator is that sent the text, Coach Dixon. Usually the uh, the Grim Reaper for IMG that I know goes by a different name that poaches kids. So this must be a. Uh, you know, a different strategy. Maybe he has a Texas relationship in place, but uh, the dude that I know that's usually going around trying to make these connections happen is not him. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Like I said, I think that I don't have a problem with either side. Like it's this is what the game has become. You know, IMG is you know uh, for good or for bad seen as kind of the evil uh, Death Star out there in the college football world. And this isn't the first time that Texas coaches have fired shots at IMG. Uh, they do things a little bit different down there. Uh, the high school coaches are still very much involved, more so than they are in the Southeast and in Florida and Georgia, which Woody will tell you. And I'm sorry if you hear the uh, sirens in my house right now. I live in a, <laughs> that's, you guys, if you're all, if you, if that's you IMG a, uh, coming for you right now. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's probably Coach Dixon. Uh, yeah, if you're a usual listener, you know that I live in the hood and that uh, that team tends to happen. But like I said, they fire back and forth. This isn't the first time this happens. And I'm team, you know, whatever. You, They're both looking out for their own and you got to look out for number one. Well, let me tell you how I, this, this is how I've always felt about IMG. I think for, for a kid like, um, for a kid like Grant Delpit, uh, Jamon Osbin, you know, uh, who's the quarterback um, I'm blanking on? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the guy that was committed to Baylor is now, what is his name? Kellen Mond. Kellen, Kellen Mond. Mond. Yeah. So, so like for all the, for all these kids, and, and I guess maybe for quarterbacks, it's a little bit different because he was part of the Baylor thing and decommitted. But, but, but I always thought that the value in going to IMG is, because because right right now we have Craig Williams as a as a as a three star running back and um, I would feel like his potential for opportunity at Crosby would be higher in terms of the amount of reps the amount of touches he would get um, for IMG I always felt like for a guy like Grant Delpit or Osbin for example because those are just the first two names that come to my head they they were committed. Uh, well, definitely in Grant in Grant's case, he was committed before he transferred to IMG because at IMG there are so many good players, so much talent that your you know your reps and your opportunities on the field is diluted by all the players that they have available to them. So it's almost in your best interest to commit before transferring. Because you might not get the opportunity to take that next level in terms of if you if you care about what we rank you or another uh, service or if you care about just your visibility in terms. Sure, other coaches are going to come uh, and watch the games and look at the tape by virtue of the fact that IMG has so much talent there. But if you're not if you're not making the most of half the opportunities that you get at IMG that you would get somewhere else, then you're almost doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's definitely a double-edged sword where you have to have some confidence in yourself. I mean, you're going to IMG. Coaches are going to be there. I mean, they are there at every game. They are there at practices. They are all over the place. They watch the film. But if you can't get on the field, you know, I have as much of a chance of impressing them as you do, you know, standing on the sidelines uh, with my notepad. You're just holding a helmet instead of a notepad. So, yeah, you got to get on the field. You can't go there and, and sit on the bench. I mean, that that is counterproductive if you're uncommitted. You're really making sure. a lot of open uh, open arguments and pleas for yourself. Uh, all your eligibility is still in place, right? I mean, it, seem, it seems like you're really trying to get a spot on a football team here in this no, podcast. No, once you, uh, well, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, I did. I, once you start college, you're eligible to click start. So I'm done. But I did play in a tackle football game this weekend. My friends have a tradition where before any one of us gets married, we play tackle football the day before the wedding, which doesn't always go over like gangbusters with the bride. But uh, so I've been sore for the last few days. But, you know, I scored three touchdowns. So if any coaches are listening, you know, I'm there, wow. I'm there, for, I'm there for the taking. I'm very hard to take down. You know, I'm built like a tank kind of. So. That's true. It's like tackling a fire hydrant. That's exactly what it is. All right, so we move on from the tweet of the week to the game of the week, where boy, oh boy, Nick Kruger, I am on a, I am on a roll here. If if anybody is following my picks and getting rich off of my picks, uh, I, I'm not going to ask for a cut. But if you'd like to send me, you know, a thank you card, that would be fine. I think the standings are as followed so far this year. You, Nick Kruger, are four and two, as is the sick and diseased Woody Womack. I am five and one. Uh, well, I heard, week- uh, I heard I heard a little I heard a little story uh, that maybe somebody close to you uh, might might have uh, might have had some high stakes interest in in the Alabama game uh, this past week and yes. it really came somebody, out on the right side. Though. Yeah, somebody I know won a four figure sum of money on that game. Um, somebody I'm very close to. Uh, but yeah, so you know it was nice for that person. And this week we are picking Alabama again. This time they're playing Texas A&M. Alabama is favored by 16 and a half points after the beating they put on Tennessee last weekend. I have texted Woody to get a pick from him, but he is on his deathbed and has not responded. Let me see if he mm. has. I haven't looked. Uh, nope, nothing back from Woody yet. So we'll get that later in the week. Let you pick first. Who you got? You got A&M. You got A&M in the points, or do you got Alabama minus 16 and a half? Well, listen. So my argument. Uh, my argument heading into the game last week for Alabama was they went into a uh, volatile, you know, uh, uh, environment in Fayetteville, took that game in Arkansas convincingly, dis- despite many people suggesting Arkansas was going to give them a very close game. It was a similar situation this past week. Go into Tennessee, uh, you know, they were they were favored by double digit points, but we know they uh, they really hung it on the Volunteers uh, this past week as well. This week coming back home. You know, I just think that all the momentum that they have right now, uh, given given the way that they've played in in hostile environments the past two weeks, for them finally to come back home and uh, be able to dish that out a little bit against an, an opponent that uh, that they know that they have to get up for. You know, they they proved it against Tennessee. Uh, you know, the week before is the is the you know is the team that everybody was hoping would would take the next step in the SEC. This time they've got. Uh, I believe Texas A&M, the only un- other undefeated team in the conference. You know they're not going to be looking past this game. Uh, you know I have to take Alabama at this point. You know given given their results the past few weeks. Boy, I, you and I are going to split this week. I think that's a lot of points. Uh, I am of the opinion that I do not, I do not wager against Christian Kirk, um, who is maybe my favorite five star of all time. I th- I think that yeah, I think I think that's a lot of points. I mean I think Alabama wins this game probably pretty easily. I think they probably win by ten or eleven. Uh, but man, 16 and a half, two weeks in a row to beat an SEC team that badly is really seems, I mean, I have no, I'm not looking at college football reference here. It seems like it's probably been rare that in the SEC, a team has just destroyed two top 15 teams in back-to-back weeks. I think A&M covers. I don't think A&M wins, uh, but you know, I think they definitely cover and we'll get Woody's pick next week or I'll get it sometime, hopefully soon. And you know, we'll have it before the game starts. We won't let him cheat uh, whenever he gets off his deathbed. Moving on, rants and recommendations. I, man, boy, Woody has stuff written here that I really want to hear. His rant is written in the notes as people telling me to vote. I'm sure that's, you know, uh, I'm sure that's a very touching rant. He can have it next week. Uh, I don't know why he's mad about that, but I never know why he's mad about anything. So uh, moving on, what do you got this week? You got anything or no? Man, I, you know, I didn't even think about that. Why, why don't you, why don't you go into yours and then I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a moment to think about mine. Mine is kind of a long-standing one. I've complained about it before, not on this podcast, but my friends. It's been going on since I was in college. It, I find it unbelievably condescending when bartenders or waiters or really any stranger refers to me as boss or chief while I'm doing something. Like, hey, you know, I'd like to order this quesadilla. All right, whatever you want, chief. It comes off as like, I don't know. Like, I don't know why they do it. I don't know if it's like so they can feel some semblance of superiority to you. I really hate it. I don't have as much of a 
problem with pal or buddy because those come off kind of folksy. But boss and chief just seem like, man, those are those are words like made for guys in flat bill hats and cargo shorts to say to other normal people to make them feel superior. So that's I think, my uh, <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I, I think, uh, I think, I think that definitely stems from, from the bro culture, uh, of, of talking to people, but cheat. Yeah. I don't like, I don't like chief boss. I don't complain. Uh, boss. I wouldn't complain about if somebody says you got it, boss, you know, I'll stick my chest out and I'll say, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> you should, I might start actually doing that. That's yeah. damn right. I got it. Boss. M- muddle, <laughs> muddle that cherry and orange for my old fashion. I am the boss. <laughs> You know, it may just start. If I get thanks, boss, I'm gonna be like, no problem, underling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, underling. Take that. Yeah, that, that'll go real well. So, so uh, yeah, chief, chief, I'm with buddy and pal. I feel like is almost more condescending than than boss. Uh, chief, chief, I but I chief, I would lump in with uh, with what you're saying. Yeah, that's that's not really one of my favorite things to be called, but uh, I don't get a buddy lot of that. Buddy and pal seem okay to me, and maybe because I feel like. The people using those words are like the over 50 crowd, which I, they can, you know, if you're over 50, you can really call me whatever you want. I, I don't care. If you're going to call me chief and you're 55, you're going to die soon anyway. I'm pretty cool with that. Uh, one one of my, <laughs> well, I, I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not a, by, by no means am I a, a faithful uh, South Park watcher or anything, but one of my favorite all time uh, moments in that show was they were watching, they were watching some, some thing or whatever. It was like two Canadians talking to each other and they went into this whole sequence of, Thanks, buddy. And then the other guy says, "I'm not your buddy, guy." And he goes, "I'm not your guy, pal." And he goes, "I'm not your pal, buddy." And then they just keep going back. It was like <laughs> it was like the Princeton offense of calling each other uh, <laughs> guy and buddy, or whatever. And I, for some reason, I just laughed so hard at that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I don't think I yeah. have a recommendation unless my recommendation is don't call me boss or chief. Uh, other than that, no, I'm pretty good. I, if you don't have nothing, I guess we can we can put a bow on this thing. Yeah, no, let's put a bow. You know, once again, you know, I, I feel like without Woody as being part of the podcast, you and me put together a superior product. We did a fantastic job this week. Boy, I'm really patting myself on the back. My recommendation is to listen to this podcast a second time because we did such a good job. So, uh, you know, that's really all I got for you, boss. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Chief. And we will be back like Goldberg next week uh, with Woody Womack joined by our side. <laughs>